Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching, whatever time you're listening, welcome to Your Onion Podcast Show. Today we have a very special guest. Her name is Susie Billings. Welcome, Susie. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. Um, Susie is the chairperson of the Qatar Professional Women's Network. Now, this is a special podcast because it is a special day on Thursday. Can you tell people what it is on Thursday? Well, technically, Friday is oh, International is Friday? Women's Day, but because <laughs> Friday thinking? is the weekend okay. here in Qatar, we are hosting a special event. We celebrate International Women's Day every year, and... Um, when possible, we have it on the actual day, but we um, have been hosting a breakfast every year for the last several years, and so we are, we're having it on the day before, on okay. this Thursday. will be Qatar's, or the Qatar Professional Women's Network celebration of International Women's Day. Nice. And so we're having a breakfast from 8.30 till 10.30 in the morning. We have a panel of four women speakers who will be talking about their experience each year um, the International Women's Day kind of comes up with a theme, a hashtag, um, as you like. And this year, it's Balance for Better. Yeah. And so we've picked four different women um, in different roles in life here in Qatar that will be talking about their careers. And most of them have also found other areas that they're letting their entrepreneurial spirit out as well um, and are here they, in Qatar. And so. are they a mixture of nationalities? Yes. Um, we have the German ambassador's wife who's going to be talking about her experience. And part of it is, you know, when you get, we were talking about this a few moments ago before we went on air, is when you get typecast as yeah. being somebody's wife, and yet you are a whole person with an identity and you have your own skill set. So Absolutely. she's going to be talking about her experience. Yeah. Um, we have another woman um, that I believe she's Lebanese and she is working um, with a large accounting firm here and she's going to be talking about her experience there but she also started um, a business in Lebanon um, that she's still engaged with. Um, we have uh, two other women and I've forgotten what their nationalities <laughs> are because um, I don't actually, I don't organize oh, the events. Okay. I'm the chair. I have a, I have a the committee chair team. Know I, know, but I, I know all of their names <laughs> and I've read their bios quickly okay, but yeah. um, I do know that we have um, yeah, one woman that uh, started um, she's quite interested in the environment, and while she's a journalist by day, she also started a side business that helps um, eliminate some of the environmental waste, um, EcoSuk. And then we have another one who is an HR professional and, and writer that writes about life here in Qatar. Nice. So, so it's going to um, be a real mix and yes. a good conversation. Yes. Um, is it open to anyone or? It's open to women only. Um, okay. Right. Unfortunately, we just because in Qatar, what we found is because we are looking to appeal to all women and because of some of the cultural sensitivities. Yeah. At the moment, we find that it's best for our events to be open to women only just yeah. so we can have a more um, open dialogue sometimes. And also there's some women here that still are not comfortable um, for cultural background reasons of, of being in a in a room with men. So at the uh, moment, we're still doing okay. women only. Yeah. Um, and also we get a, a quite a... a well, last year we co-hosted with the American Chamber of Commerce, and we had about 150 people in the room. Mm -hmm. So that was good for the size of what, what we're doing. This year we're co-hosting with the German Business Council. Okay. Um, registration links are open on Eventbrite right now. You can go to qpwn.org and look at our events and click through to the, Very good, through Susie. To the Eventbrite good, links. Good plug so, in there. <laughs> um, so that is open at the moment. Um, and where's the actual event happening? Where? So the event is at the Marriott Marquis, okay. which is really kind of just, just across opposite, the corner yeah. from where we are here yeah. um, in in one of the ballrooms there and it includes uh, a light breakfast and listening to to a four-woman panel discussion and then a chance for networking with other women here in Qatar so yes, we're hoping okay. to see you come out it does cost 100 reals that is for the catering only yeah. Yeah, so um, we don't QPWN we're a non-profit also non kind of income generating at all we just are a volunteer organization um, and we do tar we ourselves don't charge a fee but the venues where we host our events yeah. okay. um, do that so we operate on a very low budget of pretty much zero um, and we get donations occasionally to help us host our website and to print pop-up banners and things like that so, so your position is, is purely volu voluntary My peers, purely yeah. voluntary okay. though it takes a fair amount of time I and a fair imagine. amount of commitment yeah. 
um, because we do host events every month um, here in Qatar with a break during the summer. Um, this year we're breaking a little bit earlier because of Ramadan. Um, and then we also run a mentoring program every year where um, in the autumn we uh, put out a call for junior women that are within five years out of university yeah. that um, are looking for mentoring for the year. And we also put out a call for mentors, which are more senior women that are working here in Qatar. And we kind of do a speed networking host, you know, put them together to see who gels. Oh, and, really? Just um, through speed networking? Just... Well, we also look at their C their yeah. CVs, you know, on both sides and try and see if that's a good match. And But it, we have a, a bit of a speed networking session as well so that they can m meet, you know, who everybody else is and, and see if there's more, it's if there's anyone that they don't particularly yeah, gel yeah, with. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and, I think that's a great way to actually see who you're And then we, we run to. that um, throughout the year of, we we facilitate it, but it's then really up to the mentor and mentee pairs to to meet and, and help each other throughout the year. Great. So, uh, before, yeah, I'll ask you more about uh, the Qatar Professional Women's yes. Network later, but uh, give us a little insight into who you are and who am uh, I? You know, how you ended up here in Qatar. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who I am? I am. Uh, an, I sound American, and I am. Yes, that's. I yeah. am American born um, to an American father, but I also had an Australian mother. Okay. And so I started life pretty much as a dual national, mm -hmm. um, and I spent a number of my summer holidays um, which, in, Australia? In, in Australia. Which, given that southern hemisphere, it would be winter. So whereas Americans would go to summer camp, I would go to so school. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes in Australia, there was a. A small private school in Melbourne that my my mom and my auntie and my cousins all had gone to, and they kind of would occasionally squeeze me in during the summer. So I'd go from an American school where you could wear whatever you like to a very straight, you know, had to have the school uniform and wear the, oh, the really? skirt and the blazer and wow. the tie okay. and and the shoes. I really didn't like the shoes, but no. you know, but that was my way of being able to hang out with kids. If I was going to be in Australia, they yeah. were all in school, so. I would mostly behave and mostly do my homework, um, but I would do that on and off over the years. Um, grew up in California, nice. went to university in Boston. Yeah. What did you study? I did polit uh, political science and economics Okay. Um, with an interest in kind of global politics, actually. And I was uh, concentrated a little bit on the north-south relationship um, as well as, you know, the because of my age, I grew up, you know, still in the, you know, there was a lot going on with the Berlin Wall and with Russia uh, yeah. and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And so one of my interesting claims to fame is George Bush the first was president when I graduated college. And um, at my university graduation, we had um, Barbara Bush come to speak. And I went to an all women's very, well, it was the home of Hillary Clinton, to okay. give you an idea. It's a yeah. very, very strong, you know, women achievement kind of, of university. And there was a backlash of, well, Barbara Bush, she's just the wife <laughs> of the president. Yeah. So why is she coming and speaking to women that are graduating university? And it kind of blew up in the national press. Um, and we got called strident, hairy feminists yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and all sorts of things. Well, at, there happened to be a summit going on at the moment between Bush and Gorbachev. So um, Barbara Bush invited Raisa Gorbachev, who was a PhD scientist, to also come and speak oh, wow. at our graduation yeah. ceremony. And so we had the, the KGB, the Secret Service, the, you know, the CIA, all of these people kind of descended, plus the global press came to our graduation wow. ceremony. So it was quite a... Quite a memorable Absolutely. You're event, not forget and, and that. as as a politics major, you know the dynamics of of all of this was fascinating. Yeah, I bet. So, but then I had met who turned out to be the love of my life um, while I was still in college, and he lived in Melbourne, and I was in in Boston, and so because I had Australian citizenship, I decided to start my career down in Melbourne. Okay. And um, I dated him for a couple of years to see if he was the real thing and I'm still <laughs> married to him now and he's um, Australian he's Australian okay so um, yeah so I started my my working career in Australia but for an American organization actually okay so, so that, that transition was quite yeah so I um, well I was hired by them directly in Melbourne um, my boss was American okay and he kind of recognized um, 
my education and my background, because Australia, like Britain, is very much when you go to uni, you, you study, you know, a particular thing for three years, whereas a lot of the degrees in the U.S. are more liberal arts, and oh, okay. it's more critical thinking, yeah. and it's, you know, well, then what can you do? What have you been <laughs> trained to do? So, yeah, so what did you do? What was your so, first job? Well, so I ended up, believe it or not, I, I'd always had technical inclinations. I ended up um, managing um, kind of the the product development, software development. I, there were actual software developers okay. and managers that managed all the coding, but I had been, I had IBM's very first laptop wow. um, when I was at uni. So that makes was me it, feel was very Was it an old. actual laptop? Was it, or... it was a luggable. It had no hard drive. It had two, two disk drives, one for your data and one for your programs. Right. And you could carry it, but you it was... You could, it was, if you had some muscles. Yeah, I had I had some muscles, yeah, but you, you, yeah. yeah, it was it was a heavy backpack basically. Right. Yeah. Um, but because I had gotten into using technology early, um, you know, they were still doing so much by hand, and I was like, there's lots of opportunities. So it started just with using Lotus One Two Three, which was kind of the precursor to Excel, and yeah. I knew what technology could do, and I could see where it was going. So. I quickly had learned how the business operated and I could speak the business talk, but I could understand enough to talk to the to the developers because um, at the time, you know, there's just a lot of change happening. Mm. And um, because I could kind of speak those two languages, I ended up getting involved in helping create a lot of new products. Our first commercial website, we'd been dial up bit modems, which made beeps of people oh, order our information yeah, yeah. online. Oh, wow. um, so I got involved with developing our first commercial website, um, taking boring things and adding, you know, bold and different font sizes. Uh, we, we printed rep um, commercial credit report mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, and that I ended up being involved in doing that across the Asia Pacific of um, having um, you know business trips, launching new products up in Hong Kong and in Singapore and across in New Zealand, and um, so it really kind of expanded from there. And then I did a master's degree in Melbourne. Okay. Um, so it was like an MBA light focused on technology management. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I somehow caught the attention of the hires up, and I ended up getting transferred. Um, to New York. Um, our headquarters were in New Jersey, but I was um, put on a management training program and sent to work for Moody's Investor Services and planned their um, disaster recovery, business continuity planning. This is right after in 93, 94, when there had been a bomb in the basement oh, really? of the World Trade Center. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I came in in 97 um, and helped them upgrade their, because they, their offices were diagonally across from oh, the wow. World Trade Center. Okay. So I spent six months reviewing from the pump rooms at the bottom to their technologies, to their call centers. Um, you know, of, they had some facilities off island, off the island of Manhattan already, but yeah. you know, some, I got them to upgrade and there were some in New Jersey and some in upstate New York of if there was a tragic event. And, you know, as we know, several years later, there there was one. So that wow. work did did kick into yeah. play then. Um, and then I was transferred on another assignment to uh, to London, oh, supposedly for six so, months. So hold on, what's the husband doing while uh, you're ah, going well, to different places? Well, that was the big decision of initially I was when I was transferred to New York, it was for an 18 month um, kind of internal management consultancy program, specifically for people with MBAs. Yeah. Um, and most people were hired from outside. I was the only one to picked up inside the organization. And so initially we thought, well, maybe we're going to have to live apart for, for 18 months and then we'll see what happens. But um, partway into that, he, uh, he decided that uh, he would throw his hat in the ring and he gave up his job in Australia. He'd been with them for 10 years with PHP and um, came to New York and found some, some contract work there. Okay. And then the same company that he got contract with in New York uh, referred him when I got transferred to London, and he ended up working okay. for the same company yeah, contract yeah. work there. Um, but he didn't really enjoy that so much, and then he looked for um, full-time employment somewhere else, and that started his work with Shell, which then eventually brought us here. Oh. So, but like nine years later, yeah, though, yeah, yeah. so it was yeah. a farewell later. So you oh, and were... I did backpack for a year. He and I backpacked for a year in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> when? When did you do the whole backpacking? Um, well, I'd actually just finished my master's degree, okay. and we had 
we were kind of afraid of, you know, we were, we were approaching 30. We were, we were married, but, and we wanted to have kids, but not yet. Oh, okay. So um, and we just wanted, we had, we had this, I'd always wanted to travel. When I mm -hmm. met him, he didn't have a passport, but, uh, but really? he, no, well, wow. he was in Australia. Australia is a big country, you know, and I know, but most Australians want to get out and they travel do, the but world. when they're older, you know, when you're a ki not, not many kids travel overseas when they're, they're kids. Oh, really? it's, 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 well, oh, okay. more and more do now. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. cheap flights up to Bali and, and things like yeah, that. There's a but, lot working but, in London where they're behind the bar and stuff. Right. Right. But when you're kids, I mean, that's, it's a 26 hour flight as yeah, a parent, true. you're not generally going to take kids on a 26 hour flight when yeah. they're, you know, five, six no, years true. old. That's, that's, okay. I've done it. It's, it's a nightmare, but you do it. <laughs> I don't know how um, you do it, but yeah. yeah. Um, but no, we had both just, we'd had this desire. We'd been saving money, um, anticipating waiting for me to finish my master's degree and, uh, had decided that if both of our, if, if one of our companies gave us guaranteed leave without pay, that mm -hmm. we'd be guaranteed back to our job that we would take it. And in this case, both of our employers gave it to us. Um, but then three weeks before we left, I was approached by my company to move to New York. And we said, okay, we'll do it. But okay. after the trip, okay, um, but they cut the trip. We did cut it short from a year to nine months. And just where did to meet you go? Into their um, oh, a bit of everywhere. We okay. traveled throughout, um, you know, Western Europe. Um, we did the Trans-Siberian Railway. We started in yeah, St. Petersburg, yeah. but it was the Trans-Siberian Trans-Mongolian. So we went through Mongolia down to... Um, Beijing, Xi'an, Guangzhou, um, then back to Europe um, through Scandinavia. We went through the Greek Isles, down into Turkey. Nice. We did around Egypt. Um, and then in the very end, as we were heading back to the States, we did a, that was the spoiled with my parents. They funded that part of, we did a cruise um, up the, the west coast of a cruise? South America. Hold on, you said backpacking. This. Well, we, that's the thing is we were <laughs> filthy. <laughs> oh, okay. So and, it was a... and we had early on deposited a suitcase of nice clothes at my parents at the very beginning of the travel because they had said we will okay this kind is of, what we're going we'll to finish okay. this off for you nicely um, and did the uh, backpacking bring you guys closer together yes um when you have to be with somebody 24 well, 7 i was gonna say that's uh... and every day you know we didn't have it all planned out we had a rail pass you know we had pre-booked the trans-siberian but then you're in a small room with really not much in the way of there are bathroom facilities that are quite basic, quite basic, okay. and, and no shower facilities. So Ooh, you know, okay. you get to know each other quite well. <laughs> and we had some interesting roommates along the way oh, really? too. Um, but yeah, no, we found that we we do travel very well together, and and that has endured, you know, over the years. If we now we tend to be more road trips in the U.S. because our kids do some summer activities over there, and oh, okay. yeah. we take that opportunity. And it's kind of like we have a general idea plan of where we're you know the start point and the end destination point and then we just travel just travel yeah and okay. discover as we go along and now that you have technology in your hand and, oh, and yeah. yelp and you're like oh there's supposed to be a great restaurant over here or a coffee shop with a wonderful view over here that's just a yeah a world of Endless exploration choice. yeah for sure yeah Okay. So ended up in London. Okay, ended up in London. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was supposed to be a six month assignment, got in, extended for another six months. But again, this is where we were talking about the, we, he felt comfortable giving up his job when he knew that London kind of was a possibility because London had that opportunity to have a spousal visa so okay. that he could he find, could find work. he'd have to find work, but yeah. he could find work. Mm -hmm. um, I also had an opportunity to go and work for our operations in Tokyo. Um, but at that time in Japan, there was no option for a spousal visa and he oh, didn't really? want to sit there and twiddle his thumbs no. um, because I had previously in Australia turned down or asked him to to not accept a couple of positions that were they were within Australia but some of them were quite remote because he was working for a mining and minerals company um, there was one called Groot Island up in the Gulf of Carpentaria and basically I could play tennis and fish oh, you know there would have been yeah. nothing for me to yeah. do and I'm like it might be a good thing on your CV yeah but um, you know at the time I was in my 20s I'm not going to be a lady who lunches in my 20s. No, I can't you see know. you doing that. Um, so it's been a give and take, you know, I was going to say, as you've traveled along, you've yeah. kind of worked it out. Yes. So it's, it's, it's always, yeah, it is, it is that a lot of, 
of give and take. And, you know, sometimes you take it for financial reasons. Sometimes you take it for, well, we both need to develop. Mm. So, uh, come on, let's whisk yes. through to how did you end up here? Oh, yes. So, <laughs> this, we're <gonna laughs> we can do get the there. Whole... this is very long winded. I'm sorry. As yeah. I said, multinational. Um, yeah, ended up, as I said, six months in London turned into almost 10 years. Oh, had, wow, okay. had two kids there. Yeah. And um, I'd gone back to work part time after the first and then ended up stopping um, at the same company that I'd been with, that I'd moved around the world with um, after that. Um, I did some entrepreneurial things in London and to keep my mind busy. Oh, really? um, I started a book, kids book publishing company and got my books into the Ritz and into the Tower of London and did these cute little I think we need another photo podcast. Books. <laughs> this is, this is. Um, but, you know, my career at that stage, as I said, my kids were little and um, I was happy and engaged. I was trustee of a charity and doing things, but I, I wasn't earning real money. London was very expensive. We'd bought an apartment. And I think actually I was listening to the lady that founded Marhaba. She talked about that what, Hillary, yeah. that what prompted them to move was they bought a house that was too big that yes. they couldn't afford. Yes. We were kind of in the oh, same in way. The same we way. bought a lovely apartment <laughs> in London that um, short lease absolute dump and we dump put a lot of money into renovating it and it's lovely now but now other people are living in it while yeah, we're paying off the mortgage yeah benefit from yeah. the fruits of your, your so we did live in it for work. a few years but yeah. it just became aware that central london education for kids together with that and the availability of child care and and just also it was both of us were feeling like we have this window of opportunity when the kids are little mm -hmm. to go and experience something else okay and again, there were jobs that came up in Nigeria that were we looked at but weren't a good fit at the mm -hmm. time. Something came up in Dubai, and Brett's boss actually kind of yanked it. You know, he was wanted him to stay working where he was, and so Dubai didn't work out. And then when he was offered Doha, I'd never even heard of Doha or heard of Qatar. Um, and we both independently came out for a recce to check out yeah. check out Doha and went, this looks like an interesting place. And, and that was lots in 2000... That was early 2007. Okay. January of 2007. Yeah. And we moved out here in the May of 2007. So they just hosted, um, you know, yeah, the, the Asian Games. The Asian games. Yeah. So there was a lot of new build mm -hmm. around here and checked out schools and housing. Because you Google, you know, housing in Qatar. And at that stage, there was that very stage, there little. there was hardly anything. There's hardly no, anything. Absolutely. And so that began, it was supposed to be a three to four year, you know, <laughs> opportunity with Shell. Yeah. And um, after a couple of years, my husband actually left Shell and transferred to Raskas. Okay. Um, and has been with Raskas, which is now Katargas. They, so um, you followed. I you followed. were the following spouse. This so, and that was the okay. one requirement is there had to be the spousal visa option for me as yeah. well. Since I had not taken Tokyo, we, you know, this was one there where there was the spousal visa option. Mm -hmm. um, Though I found that has different elements involved in it too, it's not quite the same um, as elsewhere. Just with again how you're kind of pegged. If you're not the the spouse, I often recommend to women that are really career focused, if their husband gets a job here, to um, also interview while they're outside the country, because if you're hired from outside, you often get much much yeah, better you get conditions a better package, yes. than if than you're local hire. than if you're seen as a local yeah, hire and yeah. you're hired on a spousal visa. You're just Unfortunately, there seems to be a stereotype that goes, oh, dear, you just need to earn handbag money. I've actually had said to me, <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, but the handbags here are very expensive. They're very expensive, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but so, yes, so we've been here and ended up staying and um, partly because of the opportunity and seeing how Qatar is growing. Also, we have children in high school. And once they're once you kind of we made a decision point a couple of years ago before they started into their last few years of school that we'd rather not disrupt them. And if we were mm -hmm. going to disrupt, we'd make them move before. Yeah. And because the kids and I have my husband has two passports. Um, he doesn't have the American one, but the kids and I have three, the British, the American wow. and the okay. Australian. You know, yeah. we really had the world Absolutely. to look at. Yeah. Um, and we ended up choosing to stay, to stay here. So, um, you know, for, for good or bad, there's, there's, you know, wonderful things here and there's things that also annoy, but that's true everywhere. Yeah. And, so, um, you know, you've been here from 2007. Yes. So how has that journey been, uh, you know, from a woman's point of view, especially w because we're talking about, you know, yes, professional women, professional <laughs> women. Um, yeah, it's, it has been challenging. Um, I, I've, worked here for pay um, in three different organizations. Um, 
as you said, despite the, the accent, I am Australian, um, you know, legally, but but also not because of my husband. I'm because my mom was Australian. I grew up with, you know, understanding a lot about Australia and going to school there. Yeah. Um, and I ended up before there was an Australian embassy here, they had um, a, a contracted trade representative. And I was that here for a couple oh, of really? years. So okay. I would host incoming um, Australian companies that mm-hmm. were looking to do business in Qatar. So it was my way of being able to get in and, you know, research the market, see who the players were, try and understand, you know, the different dynamics of, and and it's challenging of who has a WASTA, who doesn't, yeah, and, and talk yeah. to people about, you know, when you're starting a business here, that somebody, is, a consultant is going to own 51% of your business, so be careful of who you partner with. Mm-hmm. You know, they can be a great asset, um, or they can be, they might promise that they're a great asset, and but you're just one of a portfolio of yeah. many. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of that was learning, which... I enjoyed was learning a lot about how the Qatar business um, environment works here and being able to advise Australian companies on that. Plus, I got to take Qatar's first kind of official delegation to Australia and oh, I really? um, took them on a, I think I, I, I overscheduled them. I had them very busy from, um, you know, early in the morning to late at night and meeting all sorts of people from Melbourne to Sydney. And I think they needed a vacation afterwards. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, but, we, but we had a great time and, and got to introduce them to various, um, various bodies there. And um, yeah, I was taking, yeah, it was a delegation of Qatari men. So that was quite, quite fun and interesting to, to, um, to see them out of their thobes and how they mm. interacted, you know, in a different environment. So, um, so that was, that was very good. Um, but also, you know, as is with expat life, my, my mom had passed on and then my father, you know, in the midst of kind of all of this and as their, their only child, um, my dad had kids from his first marriage, but they were much older and I had some contact with him, but not much, but the, the bulk of it fell to, to me to, to manage everything. And, um, so I ended up having to spend a lot of time again, kind of 24 hour commute from here to California where they had been. And so that derailed me for, for a little bit. Yeah. Did you Um, step back from uh, what you were doing? Yeah. Yes. I had to step back from the Australia, New Zealand work. Um, I came back and, and started doing some work, um, helping somebody start a business here that we talked about earlier and, you know, got their, their branding and their website and their core kind of Um, templates and started talking to people but I found that I really had more on my plate than I'd realized and also emotionally I didn't realize how much you know being an only child or you know having grown up with them as an only child there's there's a lot to adjust to and they'd been a long way away and I just needed a little break Um, so I I stopped that and but always have kept my finger in the pie I've done um, I've kept it, tried to keep up with all the new technologies, um, and so did uh, technology training at the kids' schools um, for parent-teacher things, of um, lots of people here with money with lots of new devices that they don't know what to do, so I started training classes for that for a while, um, got very briefly involved with, there was a family, family online safety institute conference here, and I did some blogging for them um, about, you know, online safety for kids. Um, and then got involved also in some women empowerment things of talking to women about kind of reinventing themselves of of taking you know different kind of career aspects there was a how women's work conference that ran yeah. for for many years here and so i was a speaker so at that a couple of that. times okay. and did some panels there um so do you think there is a lot of opportunities for women in the workplace Yes and no. It really depends. Well, it really depends <laughs> well, on your... listening to you, there, there yeah. seems to be... Well, there are, but they're not... I've got to, to do a lot of things, mm-hmm. and I'm very grateful for that, but I, it, I wouldn't be what I'd call a career. It's not like I'm a lawyer and I've gained more and more responsibility and moved up the corporate ladder. And as somebody that did the corporate life for 15 years, um, part of what I liked was that, that interaction, that bigger scale. Yeah. Um, and, you know and the fun of going on company retreats every once in a while and having different training sessions. And so I missed that part of it, but it's become much more entrepreneurial. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't be able to support a family doing the work that I've been doing. You know, it's interesting. Um, and I've earned money, but it's certainly not, um, a career job, which is what I'd always expected to have for myself because initially I was the, the higher flyer. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's been a, a big change. But there is, a, there is a huge push uh, for entrepreneurs here. Yes. And, and that's what I'm watching with interest. And I'm, 
involved with a lot of the different business groups still. And like, I think the American Chamber has a, a talk on in a week or so's mm. time. Um, one of the lawyers from um, Squire Patton Boggs is the Cheval is talking about the new entrepreneurship and the able to own your own business 100%. And I've been watching that. Yeah, to is, see. That, is that possible now? Well, this. I've been hearing about it for a while now, but as with many things, just like with software development, sometimes it's vaporware. They talk about it, but you don't know when it's actually signed and enacted. And yeah. I, I don't know that. Okay. And that's what I'm hoping I'm going to find out at the, at the AmCham meeting next week or what the time frame, time frame is for that. I know there's been some opportunity, um, and I've looked at it on and off through, through the Qatar Financial Center mm. as well for women that are, and I know there's a lot of women doing coaching businesses here, and some of them are set up through the Qatar Financial Center where they can own their own thing. But there's a, a lot bigger startup costs here of needing to be generating enough income to actually have the validia to have, you know, a location. Yeah. You can't just put a registered office sign outside your home no. and say, this is my no, business. No, you need a registered office to, yeah. yeah. And so for a lot of smaller entrepreneurs, that's been too big a hurdle mm. to operate officially, officially yeah. here. So, yes. so, so how did you get involved with the Qatar Professional Women's Network? So I actually knew um, the founder of the Qatar Professional Women's uh, Network, Christina Zinni, who yeah. started it together with a group of women back in 2010. And um, I'd been in, I knew she was starting it and I was kind of thinking about being involved, but I had too many other things in my life, as I said, going on at the time. So I attended a bunch of their events um, when I could over the years. Um, and as with many things, Doha that our expats started, you know, Christina left and then somebody else took over and then somebody oh, okay. else took over. And um, so I had always stayed aware and, you know, got their emails and went to events occasionally as I could, um, or especially like in Doha, if, if somebody that I knew was speaking, you know, I'd go to support them. Um, but it was, I also, I left in 2015 and did a, a master's degree in London. I <laughs> sent myself away to boarding school. And um, when I came back from that, really, um, I was coming back and forth a lot. But when I was back here full time in 2017, um, I just finished a law degree with a focus in, in women's kind of rights and women's law and um, around human rights and just wanted to get back involved in the, the professional women's mm. area here in Qatar. I'd done my dissertation on on um, women that had been the lead um, spouse, if you want to call it that way, that they were the sponsored spouse and that had brought husbands with them. Um, that's what I'd written my dissertation on. And I was just wanted to get back involved in that professional women's network and started just volunteering of helping with the social media. Um, as I said, I'd always kept my finger in the technology pie. And then um, the head of QPWN went away for the Christmas holidays and situation changed and she was not able to come back. Oh, wow. I don't know. Um, didn't, didn't come back to Qatar. And, and yeah. so then I stepped in as, stepped in as, as head. And so, as I said, we have, I've been peripheral to it for a long time um, and now really just trying to continue and grow the organization. Our website had disappeared um, really. several years ago. Um, nobody knew who owned the LinkedIn yeah. page. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the early stages just getting, finding out who had our URL, <laughs> getting the website back. And we just did a so soft launch of a new website just last month. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, it looks very good. I'd... And uh, again, I'm very grateful to Francis Van Wick, who, you know, as I said, we don't really manage money here. Mm. Um, and so she stepped in and offered to, to help us build that website on a pro bono basis. So if anybody goes to visit QPWN, scroll down to the bottom, you can click on, you know, creative client chemistry and, and oh, see okay. what she's doing if yeah. anybody else is is looking for work um on the website side uh yeah we finally got it took six months to get our linkedin page back oh, really? um, but we have that yeah okay. no just somebody just else had control had yeah. and we couldn't and nobody knew it, i went back through the various leaders and nobody seemed to know and we finally you know a lot of it was sleuth work but yeah. um, so we are we've always um, run our events and um, we've been very grateful for the last couple of years that we've been at the Four Seasons for most of our events um, but again the challenge is you know as things get booked up sometimes they they need a certain dollar commitment for the larger rooms mm -hmm. or they're booked out you know when we need to hold an event so we occasionally host elsewhere so for our International Women's Day we're grateful to be at the Marriott Marquis um, and we will be uh, working with them um, for that event and you know we're always looking to see um, where where we can host events where 
the bulk of women can easily get there because we're normally on a Monday night from 6 until 8 p.m. What, um, every... At once a month. Once a month. Yeah. And is it a membership or... No. Is it just... Because because we don't take in money, there's not okay. actually a technical membership. Right. Though that's probably on all of our social media platforms and, and through our email, that's... I'd say probably 60% of the questions is how can I join? Yeah. And so for some of them, we have an auto response of thank you for contacting QPWN. No membership is required. Just, you know, if you follow you our page, to you can just, yeah, you can yeah. just, you know, follow our links. So you can join our, our mailing list okay. and then we'll, we'll notify you of events and then just come along. You know? Yeah. Um, we've talked about moving to a membership model, but then we really need to look at, again, Qatar has had limited abilities for kind of nonprofit organizations yes. to incorporate. A lot of the business groups are affiliated through an embassy and get kind of sponsorship that way. Yeah, well, um, they go through QFC as well for nonprofit. Yes, and, and that's opened up recently. Yeah. Um, um, and so, so we've, be been in, we've been in discussions okay. with them on and off, um, just trying to, to see how that how that is going. Um, but for the moment, you know, as I said, we've been operating for almost 10 years under this model where we don't take any in any money. We just work with the, the hotels on a price that they're happy to, to cater for, that they'll make enough money on that. And they're obviously... Um, you know, basically contributing in kind somewhat with the, the room rental. Mm. So they're covering their costs in and you some meet, way. And you meet every every month? We meet every month. Um, and how, what is it? Is it generally a speaker that's uh, giving yeah. a presentation? Or? So I brought a list to, oh, okay. to give you some, we some ideas of yep. what we've done. Um, as, so we've run speed networking events. We run a couple of times a year. I, I, my claim to fame is I introduced speed networking um, to Qatar back in, I think, 2010 when I was with the Australia New Zealand business yeah, I group. Think I, saw, I went on one of those. I saw a lot back. of people, and I had to, had to say it, you know, four to one men to women ratio here. I'd see a lot of men come into a networking meeting mm. and then be kind of wallflowers. You know, they'd talk either to the first person that they met and spend the rest of the night talking to them yeah. or just kind of sit there with their drink and kind of eye the room <laughs> and i thought you know there's got to be a way of getting people to talk to no each, i think it's perfect and talk to each other yeah so, and our salesperson was on there uh, yes when last week there was one yes and she said it was fantastic yeah, yeah. and so yeah i've i i just that was my way of trying to get the wallflowers Very off good. the wall yeah and I, I do find it's interesting the people that are real wallflowers don't come to the speed networking no. events <laughs> but those that want to talk to people but don't know how to kind of close a conversation and move on to the next mm -hmm. i think really appreciate the format of speed networking oh, absolutely. Yeah. because you get to introduce yourself and then you don't, you know, somebody else is telling you to move on. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to, to go around that. So we host those um, once or twice a year. We've had female a uh, panel of female executives in Qatar, things about home-based businesses. Um, we've had people come and talk about the, the business culture in Qatar, particularly for um, amongst women, um, cover, uncovering unconscious bias in the workplace. Uh, we've had even one on the psychology of style of, you know, dressing oh, wow. um, okay. for uh, presentation skills, workshops, um, defining your values and strengths, defining your personal brand. Um, I know we've got something coming up on, again, on presentation skills. Um, and we've just uh, boosting your confidence. There's how to find a job in Qatar. We also run yeah. generally once a year as well for those nice. people that are, are new. We're looking to change in Qatar. So it really runs across yeah. the gamut. But we do have... A, it's a shame that it's only for women. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It should um, be a man's one. Yes, you're welcome to start yeah, one. That's yeah. that's the fun in, in yeah. Qatar. Of of what we find though is that there are because in Qatar there's this kind of four to one male to female ratio mm -hmm. because of um, all the imported labor. There there do tend to be, you know, women generally are on the back foot a little bit. Um, you know, historically women weren't in the in the workplace, and in Qatar that's probably even more so because there's not really much available in part time work. Mm -hmm. um, when a lot of the women are here with with children in the the school hours, particularly like at the British school that my kids were at for the first um, six years, you know, they finished at one p.m. Yeah, and so you know, having the office jobs that I'd been in before, you know, ran easily, you know. Nine to five, nine to seven. Um, you know that's much more. That's much more challenging here. But you see it changing. You know, as people become more aware that you know there is this talent available, but only maybe on part time hours and. Um, Yes, yes and no. Um, I've actually been, through some of the work that I've been doing recently on human rights advocacy, mm -hmm. have been engaging with the ILO a little bit. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, the both the, the Undersecretary of um, the Ministry of Labor, Mohammed Al Obeidli, and um, Hutan, who heads up the, the ILO, who's here for three years, they are talking about that part-time work is one of the areas that they're looking at in their remit yeah. of kind of making that more legal. Because at the moment, if you have a full-time job, you can't ter technically work for somebody else under the labor law. Okay. Um, and nor have there really been provisions because the idea is that you're coming in as a foreign worker there, there just haven't really been provisions in the labor law for legal part-time mm. work. We know yeah. there's lots of, mm. you know, part-time arrangements going on in, in, in smaller organizations or home-based businesses and things yeah. like that. But in the actual formal sector, that hasn't been available. And that is a, a legal change oh, okay. that is being worked that on, being as worked I understand, on. between the ILO and the ministry nice. right now. So that's a positive yeah, thing. Yeah, that is a positive yeah. So as I said, you know, there are women out there that are, are finding, you know, full-time employment here. There's a lot that are looking for part-time employment and therefore are kind of doing a, a, mm -hmm. a mix yeah. of things. Um, but the key thing I think that people assume or there tends to be the overriding stereotype that most of the women here are expat wives or ladies who lunch. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, it's one of the things that I talk about a lot and one of the things that we do within Qatar is for those women that are looking for work or, um, or just want to stay professionally collect, connected or there's a lot of women that are working in very, very male-dominated, not just um, offices, but like, you know, within construction, mm. you might be the only woman in the room. I remember being at a construction conference um, when I was uh, the trade representative for the Australian um, Austrade, uh, Australian Trade Commission, and other than the the wait staff, I was the yeah, only female conference attendee in a room of six hundred men. <laughs> wow! You know, and, yeah. and that that's more extreme than than what you see yeah. most. So a lot of it is we talk about you know our tagline is about women supporting women, women encouraging, inspiring, training, mentoring women. And so a lot of that is if you're in that, you know, if you're one of 600 in a room of, you know, then getting to meet with women that kind of bolster you up, you know, mm. before you, you go back out again. Um, but also we have to remember that there's lots and lots of women here that are working on unaccompanied status, that are serving you in the supermarkets, that are cleaning your you know, the bathrooms, that are, are working in your homes, that, you know, they are often, um, you know, the the key breadwinner yeah. in their family. Yeah. And um, because we're hosting at five-star hotels and it generally costs 100 reals, we're not getting those women at our uh, events, you yeah. know. But they are, you know, working women and they are very active here as well. Um, but because it's considered often domestic labor, it's, it's less valued. But there's a lot of working, mm. you know, professional women here that are supporting families. Do you think uh, over time, if you become a nonprofit organization, you could have events where yeah. you, you know, there is no fee to come? We, and we would, invite? we would, well, I, that's an area that I would love to see us be able yeah. to move into. As I said, the challenge at the moment is, you know, we're a, a volunteer run mm. organization, a volunteer committee. Um, so we are pulling, you know, bits and pieces from people's times and, and, you know, half of our team is employed full time. The others employed, you know, kind of half time in, in various roles. And so people are giving up bits. We, yeah. we don't have that dedicated team because no. I have, you know, I'd love to upscale the mentoring program. I'd love to expand the reach of what we're doing, but we're just not in a position as yet as of yet to do, to do that. But stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> no, and that that perfectly um, comes to the end of our podcast. Yes. But uh, we could talk for eight hours on yes. this and uh, your history as well. No. I would love. But March 7, March International 7, Women's absolutely. Day, qpwn.org. Please yeah. go and have a look and uh, and uh, Go. And stay tuned to, to what, what we're doing coming forward. So. Absolutely. And we love the, the importance of, while we are a women's only organization at the moment, you know, we really appreciate when 
um, you know, men are interested and are championing, you know, again, it's that balance for better, that gender equity in the, in the, in the marketplace. Because oh, none of us wants to be stereotyped no. that you can only behave and you can only do this. And so that's part of it. So we're, again, grateful for that all the men that are here in Qatar are continuing to work with us in various oh, capacities. Oh, no, I, I am a champion. So, um, and I love, um, you know, we have a good mix in yes. our office as well. Which, I've, I've noticed from looking at your great. other podcasts, a lot of yeah. women that I know and recognize from meeting over the years. So Absolutely. keep up the good work too. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Susie. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks. Nice and to be uh, here. please come in anytime and give us an update. Yes, we'll do. Or if there's any subject that you want to talk about. Yep. Then please. Last thing is we are looking for some volunteers at the moment. So if anybody's out there, we're, we've also got a volunteer page on our website and has a couple job descriptions up at the moment. Okay. So thank you. Great. Cheers. All right. Well, happy International Women's Day and we wish you all the best and we look forward to catching up with you next week. Take care.